Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Kelly. I'm the director of the Center for Science, Technology, and Public Policy at the Humphrey School. We're going to talk today about communicating complex information. And I, it, the, the two subparts are mindset and skill set. And I'm going to talk most about mindset. Because uh, for reasons Kathy was pointing out, um, if we're really going to engage with the public, the challenge, if you find yourself communicating complex information in a complex way, the public will not be engaged. So the challenge is to, um, to do this. Uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. said, I wouldn't give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my right arm for simplicity on the other side of complexity. And that's the goal uh, that we have to engage in, whether it's as academics or public practitioners, um, to make sure that we are getting to the simplicity that keeps meaning, but eliminates the noise. You want to get from this to this. Uh, and it, it's not easy to do, uh, but there are a, a variety of tools um, to do it. And the two that I'm going to focus on today are visualization and story. Now, there are ways to do visualization wrong. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of system dynamics, and we've been trying to persuade folks in the county and others to do, use system dynamics as a tool. But this is a systems dynamic diagram of the Afghanistan war. And uh, uh, General Stanley McChrystal is reputed to have said that if we could actually come to understand this diagram, we could win the war. Um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, if you put this in front of a group of citizens, it'd be totally bewildering, right? So we need other tools uh, for thinking about it. So um, a couple, uh, we're going to look at one other tool. So oftentimes, complexity involves really uh, uh, lots of data. So one of the data-rich subjects, and uh, Tim Penny and I teach public budgeting, so we um, uh, found this. So this is a tree map. And in the upper left-hand corner, you can see how much of the, this is the whole federal budget represented visually. And so you can see in the upper left-hand corner how much goes into Social Security. And then if you go towards the middle, you see the defense commitment in relationship to Social Security. And then most scary of all for us, uh, you can start to see how big our interest payments are are as a percentage of the federal budget. Now, this is a pretty serious topic. We can also have a little bit more fun with it. So this is uh, the top songs on iTunes uh, presented as a, um, as a tree map. And so in the left-hand corner, uh, this is based on the song's chart position. And we can change um, the organization. Um, and so now you can see that the Obviously, the top song is in the upper left-hand corner and occupies the most space. But then if you change to days in the top 100, Adele leaps to the fore um, with her songs. And, uh, and so this is just one tool that people um, can use. Now we're going to shift to a different kind of tool. So the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has looked at multiple measures of how well countries are doing. And uh, so they've created this blossom chart um, that represents multiple dimensions of well-being for a country. And on the right-hand side, you can see the different uh, dimensions um, that they're trying to represent in the blossom chart. And if we change education, you can see how the weighting changes. And, uh, and then you can also um, go back to the, the, the balance chart, and then you can change it by rank. And you can see that Turkey is not doing very well. And on the other hand, Australia is leading the pack across these range of measures of well-being. And I saw this and I thought, what if in Hennepin County we could take census tracts or zip codes and assess in multiple ways and demonstrate to the public how their communities are doing on multiple dimensions? So that was one uh, representation. So um, I've been using a lot of technology for this, and some people might object that um, not, you don't always have access to that when you're doing public engagement. 
So this is a map drawn in uh, 1854. Uh, it's one of the most famous examples of visual presentation. It was de uh, done by John Snow in order to prove after a cholera epidemic in, in London in 1854 that cholera was waterborne rather than airborne. So um, this is um, Broad Street and you can see in the top left hand corner the Broad Street pump which was the source of the cholera and the, so the deaths which were the black bars at each address were clustered near the Broad Street pump and then he proved that when you looked around at the patterns the deaths were clustered within walking distance of the pump the, the place where people would go to get their water so he did this with pen and ink not with a computer um, and then there's another example uh, Jessica, Jessica Hagee is an artist who runs a site called This Is Indexed, and uh, this is one example. She does her, her uh, examples on index cards. <laughs> and so this is an index card she drew that uh, posits a proposition regarding the relationship between ethics and medicine. So if you, profit is low on ethics and high on medicine. Uh, <laughs> prevention is high on ethics and low on medicine and care takes advantage of both. And then uh, just another example, um, this is a, this, uh, a little drawing that demonstrates the, that the answers are often hiding in plain sight. Um, so um, there are a variety, of, a variety of visual tools available to you, um, but there's some ethics involved in this. One is that as uh, public um, servants in a uh, democracy, we've got an obligation, an ethical obligation, among other things, to ensure that all of our citizens have access to information, to uh, democratic access. And complexity, to the extent it's a barrier to that, is an ethical challenge for us. Um, but, uh, but there's also, there's some parameters to this, because one of the risks is that in, your de in the design of your visual communication, you could fall into the sin of trying to manipulate the audience. So here are a couple more examples from uh, the uh, cholera epidemic. Um, so the, the policy solution at the time of the cholera epidemic was to take the pump handle off the Broad Street pump. Uh, and so that happened about a week into the uh, cholera epidemic. And so you can see according to this chart, which is a daily chart of deaths during that, I mean, this was, this was a tragedy, 700 people in a week. Um, so this is one representation, but if you change the scale, then it looks like the removal of the pump actually caused the decline in deaths. You know, so the speculation is that even if the pump hadn't been removed, the, there weren't new inputs into the water under the Broad Street pump and that the cholera bacteria in that reservoir would actually have died out over time. Uh, but, um, this is one way of representing it. And then if you were gonna be a little bit more emotional about it, you might represent it this way. Uh, and, and so one of the questions is, is this maybe a little too manipulative um, as a way of representing the situation? So we're gonna switch to the other tool. Um, Hans Rosling at the end said that what he was doing was telling a story using the visual presentation. And story is another way to simplify information without losing meaning. Um, an individual, you can use an individual story. I'm sure all of you have someone um, that you're uh, part of Hennepin County or the university serves whose story represents the best of what you do. Um, and you can incorporate that story. You can also tell system change as a story. We did a project for environmental services for the county on surface water governance. And one of the assertions people kept raising was, well, things aren't broken. Why do we need to change something? And so we told a story about how our goals with respect to water governance had changed over time from initially building reservoirs, supplying cities with water, to soil and water conservation in the Dust Bowl years, to um, preventing flooding and getting water off the land quickly so our homes don't flood, to now where we actually want to think about slowing water down um, in order to recharge reservoirs, uh, recharge aquifers, and, um, and, and keep um, pollution from flowing so quickly into our um, streams and lakes. So you can tell a story that could potentially disarm um, resistance to change. And then there's story as um, metaphor. 
This is a Robert Frost poem, and I hope he'll forgive me for my editing of it. Uh, but we, don't, we want to stay as close to time as possible. So out of the mud two strangers came and caught me splitting wood in the yard, and one of them put me off my aim by hailing cheerily, hit them hard. I knew pretty well why he had dropped behind and let the other go on away. I knew pretty well what he had in mind. He wanted to take my job for pay. The time when, I, when most I loved my task, the two must make me love it more. By coming with what they came to ask, you'd think I had never felt before the weight of an axe head poised aloft, the grip of earth on outspread feet, the life of muscles rocking soft and smooth and moist in vernal heat. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation. As my two eyes make one in sight, only where love and need are one, and the work is play for mortal stakes, is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future's sake. So if Robert Frost could put the meaning of life into a poem about splitting wood, each of us ought to be able to find a way to take our most complex work and turn it into a story that we can tell so that our citizen participants can feel that the work of participation is not work but is instead play. And that we will feel the same way about doing the job and we'll do a much better job at public engagement. Thanks very much.